What I find often is that uh, bioterror is kind of the uh, unwanted stepchild of, um, uh, of security policy. I mean, they're, they're, people know that there's a problem, but a lot of people really are not expert in it and don't really focus on it and, and what, what the, the real threats and vul vulnerabilities are. Uh, I also find that oftentimes people seem to think that uh, bioterror is some kind of new phenomenon that we've only heard of in the last and uh, with, sometime within the last uh, century, people often associate it with the, um, you know, the, the various smallpox um, uh, stockpiles that both the U.S. and the Soviet Union had. But uh, it really actually has a long and unpleasant history. Um, the, the Assyrians back in 600 uh, BCE uh, used to poison the water supply of some of their opponents uh, with a, a deadly fungus. Um, in 1346, the Tardars would use uh, corpses, plague-infested corpses, and they would catapult them into the cities over the walls um, against their enemies. And that is one theory about how the plague actually reached Italy. Uh, the British famously used uh, smallpox-infested blankets ag against the uh, Indians in se 1763. And then obviously, as I said, they, in the Cold War, both the US and the Soviets had, had their various smallpox programs. Now, the US kind of ended their, all of their bioterror programs after Vietnam. They said, this is not the kind of thing we're going to be engaged in. And there was sort of a long, quiet period where the U.S. didn't really think about the issue of bioterror, neither offensively nor defensively. Obviously, today, we still don't think about it offensively, but, uh, but defensively has become a greater issue in the last 10 years for a number of reasons. First of all, obviously, September 11th, uh, increased our overall awareness to the issue of terrorism and how vulnerable we are. But at the same time as the, the September 11th attacks in 2001, we also were subjected to the anthrax attacks, which took place um, not far from here in, 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 the, uh, in the Capitol, in, in the, especially in the Senate office buildings. They, those attacks cost as little as $2,500 to prepare the anthrax that was sent around, but it almost shut down the Postal Service. It shut down Capitol Hill for a, a good while. Uh, you know, which some might argue is a good thing or a bad thing, but nevertheless, um, uh, it, it caused a number of deaths, but easily could have caused more. And uh, it, it sort of raised awareness here in the U.S. that, that we had some significant vulnerabilities in, in an, area of, an era of asymmetrical warfare. It was fairly easy for a non-state actor to cause a great deal of damage to the U.S. without a lot of expenditure on their parts. Uh, we had the uh, other incidents in the uh, in the last decade, or the the ricin in the Paris subways, uh, the dirty bomber uh, p guy who um, was was um, Padilla, who was um, trying to attack the U.S. through a dirty bomb, um, and th and then even today, there's a story going around about um, anthrax spiked heroin in Europe, and uh, there are questions about whether this is a whether the motivation behind this was terrorism or um, different drug gangs uh, going at it. But the fact that there has been anthrax spike heroin uh, raises the issue that it's really not that hard to do. I mean, I couldn't do it. I'm not a scientist. But, I mean, if somebody with the technical know-how uh, could do it, and it is a dangerous and, and scary thing. So as a result of all of these things, the, uh, the U.S. has kind of woken up to the issue. Um, in 2001, the government uh, increased funding for bioterror research to over $500 million. The Bioterrorism Act of 2002 um, assigned responsibilities throughout government to make sure you know, who knew, everyone knew what, what they were supposed to be doing. Project BioShield in 2004 makes it easier to develop uh, countermeasures and helps the U.S. stockpile them. Now, uh, I think these are all good and important developments. And um, it's important to recognize what some of the differences are between conventional warfare and, um, and biological. As I mentioned, it, it's uh, asymmetrical, meaning somebody without a lot of resources can cause a lot of damage on a, a stronger, richer opponent. Um, the, the standard health response changes an issue of bioterror because you have a very narrow window with which to respond. Um, there's the, the danger of first responders who are um, you know, our, our lead protectors in, in a problematic situation getting harmed themselves, and there's a lot of concern about that. And then obviously there's the issue of panic. One, one of the things that I saw when I was in the, in the Bush administration when we would war game out these scenarios about a bioterror attack or a nuclear attack 
all this area is called CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Um, but we, I remember one war game scenario where there was an attack, and what we found and we, we didn't expect is that even there, there are a whole bunch of people who were not affected by the radiological device in this instance, who nevertheless swamped the local hospitals because th they were concerned. They were, uh, we call these people the worried well. And as a result of those war games, we've now put into place um, initiatives to make sure that we are prepared for the worried well and know how to um, incorporate that in, into our response. Now, the key goals in biodefense are uh, vigilance. You have to have a governmental commitment to biodefense and make sure that, that it is maintained. And uh, I've seen some recent issues that make me worry on, on that front. Um, there is a uh, House supplemental, uh, the, House, the, the House version of the supplemental uh, about a month ago, did, took about $2, million, $2 billion out of um, BioShield. And um, when the administration was asked for a SAP, a statement of administration support, they did very little to, um, to oppose this uh, taking out of the money and kind of led people to believe that they don't take this issue that seriously or they're not, they're not that concerned about it, they, that they don't feel that the biodefense funding has been that effective. You also have to stay ahead of the curve in terms of new research. Um, all sorts of uh, feasibility studies and countermeasures. You, you need to co constantly be developing new products, which was the goal of, uh, of the BARDA program when it, when it was set up. And then also you need civil defense and distribution plans. I mean, you can have great countermeasures, as we saw with the uh, swine flu incident that I'm going to talk about in a, in a moment. But if you don't have a way to distribute it, um, it doesn't really do anybody very much good. Now, obviously, we need to recognize that it's not just an American problem because anyone uh, can be targeted, any nation can be targeted. I mentioned the Paris incident in 2003 with the ricin. And because of globalization, untargeted nations could be significantly affected by some type of bioterror incident. Uh, if you recall the, uh, the SARS incident a couple of years ago, obviously that was naturally occurring and not, um, and not man-made, but um, it, it cost um, the Asian countries $11 billion. Um, and uh, 11 to 18 billion dollars, um, and there was a, an average loss, economic loss of about two million dollars per person with SARS. So, uh, per person who um, with SARS, so there, there were a number of deaths, but the number of deaths was quite small compared to the overall economic impact. And that's something to, to be aware of. The overall deaths were about um, 775 people, which obviously is a tragedy, but nothing compared to um, the economic loss, which which was much greater. Um, the Brookings Institute estimated that if uh, we had an, an H1N1 pandemic here and schools had to be closed, there would be an, a loss of between 10 and $47 billion in U.S. and economic activity alone. So um, even if it were to start in another country, it comes here, then we have significant economic vulnerabilities. So uh, w with that in mind, I wanted to look a little bit uh, at the flu and how we handled the situation of the flu and what it says about our bioterror capabilities. As we know, the actual uh, death toll for the swine flu in 09 was far lower than predicted. And I think part of the reason may have been that the US had a serious and active effort to prepare for a possible outbreak. Starting in 2005, President Bush had a $7 billion strategy, which included investments in vaccines, antivirals, domestic preparedness, and international cooperation. We looked at this issue of, uh, of a pandemic influenza, specifically a word about avian flu, but we took what's called the all hazards approach, meaning you prepare for a specific incident, but you use tools that could be used in a variety of incidents to, get to, uh, to fight back against a variety of potential threats. And um, that, that was a good thing because in 2009, when the Obama administration was confronted with swine flu, not avian flu, at a time when I, I will say that not a single one of the top 20 appointees at HHS were confirmed, which is, uh, I thought was a huge problem, um, that what they did was they dusted off the Bush avian flu plan, applied it to swine flu, and I think for the most part did, did, a, did a pretty good job with it. Obviously, there were some hiccups. Um, within the U.S. and outside, the Mexican government, for example, uh, was a little slow to pick up uh, on, the, um, on the outbreak. There is a company called Veritech from Seattle that does um, the detection of um, little uh, variations in patterns and in hospitals, et cetera, and they picked up on the fact that there was some kind of viral outbreak in Mexico weeks before the Mexican government or PAHO, the Pan-American Health Organization, picked up on it. Um, 
for the most part, the government did a good job in communications, and we had trained our, our people to do that. The biggest hiccup in terms of communications was obviously Joe Biden's problematic statement that uh, nobody should go in confined areas, which almost destroyed air travel and, and, uh, um, and, and public transportation in, in this country. But it's interesting that Biden was not was a relatively new person to the executive branch and had not been participating in the trainings. And the people who were part of the executive branch who carried over the career staffers, for example, were very good and very odd messages. There was a guy named Rich Besser at CDC, who was the acting director of CDC, did a great job in terms of tamping down panic, but he also parlayed it into a job as uh, ABC News chief medical correspondent. So uh, he kind of shone throughout the, the whole incident. And then obviously what I'd say is the third biggest problem uh, in the administration's vaccine response was the the fact that they overpromised and underdelivered with respect to vaccine. In July of 2009, they said there would be 160 available, 160 million available doses by the fall. And in October, they realized that they were not even getting get close to that, that they were more in the area of 28 million. And they waited until late October or even early November to tell the public of this. And then you had all these people who were waiting to get vaccines and, and were turned away. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of distribution is a very difficult and complex one, but it's one that the administration really needs to focus on and look at. And um, I've written about some specific things that, that should be done. I know the administration likes this notion of having the Postal Service distribute, um, which is an okay uh, approach, but I think it's... Um, it should be only one arrow in the quiver. One problem with having postal distribution is the Postal Service Union has said that they want um, one public um, peace officer or one security officer to be with each mail person as they deliver the mail. I don't think that's unfeasible in the time of some kind of panic. Um, one, one thing that I like are home med kits where people can prepare on their own for potential problems and purchase something that they, that they are concerned about. And uh, a lot of the, some people in the public health community are... are concerned about that because they say that, um, oh, well, people won't use them right. But we've had studies that show that people actually do use countermeasures right if they're in sealed packages and told when and how to use something. Um, and and it, it gives people more control over their own lives. It gives people <coughs> more security. Also reduces the burden that government officials have when they have to distribute uh, huge numbers of countermeasures to a very large and very well spread out uh, population. So a couple of lessons from the recent uh, um, uh, from the recent outbreak. I think the government needs to learn from recent experiences, specifically on these issues of communication and distribution. Um, I know the president in his State of the Union promised some kind of bioterror plan or review. Uh, that was over six months ago, about eight months ago now, and nobody quite knows where it is. What I've heard is that it's held up uh, by OMB because OMB feels that they don't have the budget for the plan as laid out, but uh, I'm very curious to see what the, the plan is, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be uh, commenting on it. And then we need to do um, more work on, um, on these questions of distribution, infrastructure, and education, and to look at some of these issues that, that, that I mentioned. So in conclusion, I would just say that uh, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last 10 years in terms of preparing for bioterror, but we still have a long way to go, and um, uh, I, we, we, we've been lucky thus far. I think uh, I have a slide that I gave out about the number of deaths from various uh, flus over the, over the years. Some people think that because these flus have occurred in the past and um, keep it recurring in a semi-recurring pattern, that it's inevitable that we're going to have another one. Not sure it, it's inevitable, but it is something that we need to prepare for. Thank you. Thank you, Tevi. Um, before we open it up to the floor for questions, I just wanted to start with a question of my own. Um, can you talk a little bit, of, or can you expand a little bit on the preparedness for a bioterror attack in the public transportation system? Is that uh, who has responsibility for it, and where are we on it in terms of preventing something like this happening, say, on the metro on a given yeah. basis? That, that, that is an excellent question, and, and this notion of who is responsible, I think, is a really important one. I recall a meeting that I attended in, in the Bush White House back in, in 2005 where Secretary Card, Andy Carter, who was the chief staff at the time, was grilling the um, Homeland Security Advisor, was Fran Townsend, the Secretary of HHS was Mike Levitt, and the Secretary of um, DHS of Homeland Security was Mike Chertoff. So um, Fran Townsend was flanked by these two guys, uh, Chertoff and, and Levitt, and Andy Card, who's sitting across the table from her, says, all right, Fran, this is all great after she gives a big briefing, but what I want to know is if everything goes wrong and avian flu breaks out in the U.S., who does the president call first? And she looks at him, sit, flanked by um, Mike Chertoff on one side and Mike Levitt on the other side, and she says, Mike. 
<laughs> well, that doesn't do anybody any good. I mean, it, but it, it kind of, I mean, everybody sort of laughed. Um, we kind of went, went on from there. But there are uh, huge problems of overlapping uh, jurisdiction. I'm not necessarily a fan of the uh, Washington Post's top secret America. You know, everything's redundant and, and, uh, and, and overlapping. But, you know, if you had an incident like that, I mean, the, the you have the Secretary of Transportation, you have the Secretary of HHS, you have the Secretary of DHS, I mean, all these people and the Department of Justice would be investigating, so you would have all these overlapping responsibilities, and it, and it is a, a real concern. Obviously, the local metros are most responsible for the security of their areas with um, intelligence help from the national infrastructure. I, I read a, um, um, a, a great book about the, um, the homeland security efforts in New York City by the New York City Police Force. You know, the New York City Police Force has started their own um, anti-terror and security and intelligence unit, and they said that they started it. It's uh, it's about um, something like 600 people at, at, at a force, which most police forces can't afford to create such a large force, but uh, with it, within their own force. But they started it because they said they weren't getting sufficient information and intelligence from the national government. Well, th that is really frightening to me, and um, and th there needs to be better intelligence sharing so we can prepare for for the incidents like that one. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Marshall. We can hear you. Talk loud. It, it takes a couple of seconds to get hot. If it's not, okay. I'll repeat the question. All right. Okay. The, the question I have is that public health officials have gone out and media has publicized that uh, pandemics will be inevitable. And we've heard a lot of information about the great avian flu risk and then the SARS risk and the H1N1 risk. And I think the public is starting to get inoculated from the cry wolf risk to where they're not believing that this will actually occur. Isn't this kind of working counter to what you really need in a, uh, uh, a bio threat environment? I think that's a fantastic question. This, this question of, of, of crying wolf or the potentially crying wolf is a huge issue. I mean, if if the government says, oh, you better watch out, um, you know, this thing's coming and it doesn't come, then people start to say, well, how seriously do, do we have to take them? And there's a related issue, which is if people um, start not trusting the government's countermeasures or instructions. I mean, I think we saw this problem in both the left and the right in the recent incident. You had Bill Maher saying that anybody who takes the swine flu vaccine is, quote, an idiot. Um, I would say he's somewhat idiotic for making that comment, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's just me. Um, and then you had uh, Glenn Beck on the right saying that he would do the opposite of whatever the Secretary of Homeland Security said. And you got the sense that he was saying it because it was a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. He wouldn't be saying that. And I think we need to kind of get away from this notion of partisanship in the area uh, of bioterror. I mean, if someone from CDC is telling me you know, go into your shelter or take out this various countermeasure, this, uh, this particular countermeasure, or pre be prepared for a certain incident. I have to look at them and say these are healthcare professionals; they're not partisan people, and, and they're, you know they're they're looking at the overall um, good of the country. But every time the government either says something and doesn't happen, or worse, they make a promise, overpromise, and underdeliver as they do with the distribution. I think it makes this problem worse. Good question. Got a couple more questions, uh, Dan. Yeah, hi, Dan Pollock. Um, I'm a little bit surprised, just as I am in the case of a dirty bomb, that the bad guys haven't gone ahead and done this. As you said, anyone with basic biological knowledge knows some of the ways that they can introduce these things into our water supply and so on. Is a lot going on that we don't hear about still, or have they just not tried to do this? And, and if so, do you understand why? Right. Well, I mean, a, a lot of what I know on this is classified and I can't really, really get into, but Rest assured that, um, I mean, I, I am pretty confident that there are bad guys looking into this. That, that I can say. And I also know that just because it's doable doesn't mean it will be done. Uh, so let's say you have somebody who can weaponize anthrax and they know how to do it. Is it can they necessarily get in the country? Do they actually know where to put it to put the most damage? There's a whole lot of pieces that they have to put together. And we have actors on our side who, while imperfect, are trying to stop them. So it's it's not a slam dunk. I mean, I used to, uh, when Tom Clancy was writing novels, I, I would read his novels, I'd wonder, oh, why don't the terrorists do this? Why don't they do 